Hello. This Lent, we have been looking at the six traditional questions put to a candidate for baptism. And this last week before Holy Week, we look at the final question. Do you come to Christ, the way, the truth and the life? This is, of course, the punchline from these questions. All the previous questions have been tending towards this one. And the candidate's yes to this question is what opens the door to the rest of the service, to the sacrament of baptism, which in turn opens a door to the whole of a Christian life. The earliest Christians seem to have referred to their faith as the way. St. Paul used this phrase in his speech in Jerusalem in Acts 24. And Luke says later in that chapter that the Roman governor was well informed about the way. The reference is perhaps to John the Baptist's call to prepare the way of the Lord, citing Isaiah 40. Or maybe to Jesus describing himself as the way, the truth and the life in John's Gospel, chapter 14. We've grown so used to this phrase that maybe we have stopped noticing that its meaning is slightly obscure. Jesus doesn't describe his teaching as the way. Jesus didn't write as a book. If he'd done that, then we'd have known exactly what he meant. Do it my way, which means something like, I told you what to do, obey, and you will stay out of trouble. I think... Perhaps nine out of ten non-Christians understand that that's how our faith works. Sadly, so do some Christians, actually, but it really isn't, is it? Most of us understand this is far from the case. Actually, in a sense, it's the opposite of the case. The Christian church is not where you go to find the people who follow God's rules. On the contrary, it's where you go to find those who know that they disobey who know their need of forgiveness and their need of grace if their life is to be worthwhile. Or Jesus could have said something like, follow my way of life. And then we'd have understood and known that he was talking about a, a set of habits and customs. Some people shrink Jesus down to fit them by turning him into a religion, by which I mean a set of Rituals and habits are daily, weekly, yearly round. Eat fish on Fridays, dress the church in purple for Lent, that kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with these habits in themselves. They may do good and there are many worse habits. But being in the old phrase, a churchman or churchwoman, is not in the least the same as being a Christian. Let's go back to what Jesus actually said. Jesus described himself, his very self, as the way. So what does this mean? Many of us find it helpful to think of life as a journey and of the Christian life as a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage being about both journey and destination. A journey whose destination is godly and also a journey carried out in a godly spirit. And so we have John Bunyan producing his classic book, Pilgrim's Progress. The Pilgrim's called Christian. It's not a subtle book. Uh, Christian sets out from his home, weighed down by a great burden of sin. But quite soon in his journey, he comes to the cross and lays the burden down. And after that, he has all sorts of adventures, nearly gets lost in lots of different ways, but ultimately manages to cross the, the river to the celestial city. It's a book I'm very fond of because it is so vivid in its descriptions and punchy in its na narrative. That said, as a guide to the Christian life, I think it is rather lacking. The book operates almost entirely at the level of story of allegory, in fact, of narrative. There's almost no attempt to depict Christian's character, no development of character. And I think this misses something essential about the Christian life, that we are changed by it as we live it. 
I believe this is one of the meanings of Jesus being the way, that our progress along the road consists of becoming more like Jesus. Our character is formed by the road and formed so we more resemble the master. I might equally say that we become truth through our attempts to show God's truth to the world and life. We become the means of life to others and become ourselves more deeply and abundantly alive as we go along. We're formed in this way because our master is so constantly present to us as we make our way along the road. Perhaps the greatest weakness of Pilgrim's Progress, in my humble view, is that Jesus is almost entirely absent from Christian's journey. I say almost entirely because there is a character called Goodwill, who we learn much later on was Jesus himself. Um, he gives Christian uh, instructions about the way to go. But as Christian makes his way, follows those instructions, he does so alone or in the company of some fellow travellers, some of whom are helpful, some of them much less so. But it is not this way in real life. In reality, the way that the pilgrim walks is Jesus' own self, and the pilgrim's character is shaped by Jesus' company along the road. What do I mean when I say that a Christian pilgrim comes more and more to resemble Christ? I've already said that being a Christian is not about following rules and doing good things. No doubt a Christian, as her life is moulded, will tend to do more good and less harm. But that's not the essence of following the way. Rather, I mean that the Christian's character will more and more take on the basic and long-term pattern of Christ's own character. Jesus chose for himself his metaphor as a way of speaking about this process of change, a way of describing his life entering our lives so that our characters come to resemble his. And he didn't choose a metaphor that works through words, but one that operates through things and actions. I'm speaking about Holy Communion. You'll remember, I'm sure, that Jesus told us to eat the blessed bread because this is my body. He told us to drink the wine, for this is my blood. Holy Communion, the Eucharist, is a means by which Jesus gets inside Christians, if you'll pardon the literalism. Means by which Christians metabolise Jesus as we metabolise our food. For this reason, Holy Communion is important. It's important if you can to take communion. But I think we can miss the point when we make the Eucharist the sole focus of our devotion, perhaps to an extent that we squeeze out times and spaces where we can sit back and think about how communion is changing us. I think we need to take time to think about how our last communion has worked on us and on what we take into our next one. Uh, the need for spaces like that is one reason why the pattern now in St. Thomas of Becket's uh, worship is that we have communion every other week. So we give ourselves space between times to digest. But the Eucharist is central. The reason it is central is that the whole life of the church and of a Christian follows that pattern. It is sacramental and Eucharistic in quality. The essence of this sacrament is that we collaborate with God to bring it about. Holy Communion demands that we bring something to place on the table. Bread, wine, the fruit of our work. And these concrete items represent our whole lives in all their complexity. Sometimes at the offering, congregations are asked to place onto the altar not just bread and wine, but things that represent their whole lives. Perhaps a mobile phone for some, perhaps a wallet or a photograph of a loved one. 
What happens when we go to a communion service is that we drag into church the whole complexity on and mess of our lives. And we are invited to take that up, place that on the altar. What we place on the altar is a gift to God. It is our gift. And if it's a mess, well, that's because that's all we've got to give. But our gift is the raw material of, tra of the miracle of transformation. Afterwards, our lives are given back to us, given back, made that bit more Christ-like, with our characters amended so we resemble Jesus just a little bit more. This is the basic pattern of Jesus's life. He gives himself and his body and blood become transfused into our life, into the life of the world. And this is also the basic pattern of the church's life and of the Christian's. We place our own lives on the altar and they are transformed into the image of Christ. And then we go out. We go out to serve, to try to live as Christ. And we get hurt and we make a mess. Or maybe we realise how much of a mess we already made. So that next time we have some more mess to drag back into church so as to place it upon the altar and the whole cycle begins again. So I want to suggest that this is what Jesus means when he says that he, in his own self, is the way. This sacramental pattern to our pilgrimage is the mechanism by which we are transformed day by day, step by step along the way, so that we resemble Jesus. Jesus' own truth, his own life, become ours. Next week, on the evening of Maundy Thursday, we will remember Jesus' institution of Holy Communion. If you're able, come to church, join with us. Bring all your mess and give it to him. And if you're unable to come, you might still want to sit down next Thursday evening and think about that raw material of your life. What works, what hurts, what's stuck and what's in motion. Give it all to him. Let it be buried with him. And then it will, in due course, come back to you, renewed and resurrected. That's the end of this year's Lent Talks. My prayer for you is a holy week full of recollection and an Easter full of joy. God bless. <laughs>